Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is going to be a treat today. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about Glynis. Glynis Fox is the author illustrator of 1177 BC, a graphic history of the year civilization collapsed with Eric H. Klein, Charlotte Bronte before Jane Eyre, and Persephone's Garden. Her comics have appeared on the NewYorker.com, the Comics Journal, Popula.com, Seven Days Vermont, the Vermont Quarterly, and MirthaMagazine.com, for which she was nominated for an Ignatz Award. She was the recipient of a Ful Fulbright Fellowship to Cyprus, where she published Archaeology Lives in Cyprus and Cartoons of Cyprus, and has worked as an illustrator on archaeolog archaeological projects in Greece, Cyprus, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. She lives in Vermont and teaches at the Center for Cartoon Studies. Please give a warm welcome to Glynis. This is on? Yes, it is. OK. Oh, good. I was going to ask. Um, ooh. Thank you all very much for coming. That's better. <laughs> um, I'm I'm still in celebration mode for the launch of this book, which came out on Tuesday. And so um, almost no one's ever seen it. Thank you. Uh, we had a big party last night at um, the Venetian Soda Lounge in Burlington. And um, I'm not hungover, but. Uh, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is talk uh, about the making of this comic, which is an adaptation of Eric Klein's uh, book 1177 BC that came out in 2014. So this is 10 years after his original book. And that book was very successful. And so th the editor asked me to make this graphic adaptation. So I'm going to talk to you about the process of, of how that came about and how I came about a little bit uh, in the direction of making this comic. And I'll, um, but I'll begin with reading the first little bit of the book that will give some context and drama that will launch us into this story. Here's the prologue, page one. Uh, readers of the book don't know this yet, but I'm telling you that this takes place somewhere around the 12th century BC, very long time ago, in the Nile Delta, in a, a campsite of some uh, sea peoples, so-called. Here's our main guy. Hell, where are you going? We're about to eat and Grandpa's going to tell another tale. Again, about how he fought in the sea people's battles? Yes, tales of the heroic past, palaces, princesses, and royal gifts of imported gold. That's the problem, little sister. It's the late 12th century BC, and the world Grandpa describes is gone. Across the countries of the Eastern Mediterranean. Oh, I need to get this thing out of here. Is that possible? Uh, I don't think we can swept a, a wave of destructions. The, the great powers of the late Bronze Age, the Hittites, uh, the Mycenaeans, the Canaanites, the Cypriots, and others have all fallen, and civilization as we knew it came to an end. I can't listen to Grandpa's stories of the past and of recent battles with the Egyptians without asking, what happened? What brought the late Bronze Age to an end? Was it because of us, the Sea Peoples? That's what I aim to find out. I'll start with my friend Shesha. Her family works on the mortuary temple of Ramses III at Medinet Habu in Luxor. You're friends with an Egyptian? Shasha will know the Egyptian side of the story and a lot more besides. Pell, wait! Don't forget your sea people's hat, but maybe don't wear it around the Egyptians. Thanks, Auntie. Pell, you're just in time. Hi, Shasha. 
My dad and his team of sculptors are nearly finished. They're carving the story of Ramses III's battles with the sea peoples on the north side of the temple. My grandpa fought in those battles. Then you know all about it. I know his version. My job is to make sure they spell everything correctly. You can help. You know I can't. You don't read hieroglyphics or anything else. I don't write either. No wonder you need me. Ow. So tell me what's going on in this scene. This is one of many battle scenes, and there were several groups of invaders. Dad, we're coming up for a closer look. Careful on the ladders. I recognize these guys. They're the Peleset, Jekker, Shekelesh, Danuna, and Weshesh. This kid seems to know an awful lot about them. Maybe he can tell us where they came from and why they went out of their way to attack. I heard they could be as, from as far away as Sicily, Sardinia, the Aegean, Western Anatolia, and Cyprus, but no one place has been identified as their home. We do know when they attacked. It was the eighth year of Ramses III's reign. The year was 1177 BC. Okay, now we're in it. <laughs> and I'm gonna pause this and talk about me. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is me, age 16, dressed for the cartoon character I eventually would hope to uh, star in a book that I would write many years later. But more recently, these are some of the books I've published in going back to 2017. Um, and about uh, 20 years ago, these two books I published in Cyprus. Being in Cyprus with that Fulbright Fellowship uh, kind of woke me up to the world of archaeology where you could see on the, the iconography on ancient vases was also something that you could order in a taverna. So the, the connection between the landscape and uh, the history seemed very close there. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, where there isn't the, the depth of history, and so this was very exciting to be there. This is from that same book, Cartoons of Cyprus, and um, it's my first joke about the Sea Peoples, who were intriguing to me even then. And the mom is saying, of all the nice young men around here, why do you have to go out with one of the Sea Peoples? Aw, oh, he's... Ma, Ma, he's really nice, though. So being in Cyprus for that time of the Fulbright allowed me to travel. So I went, uh, this is uh, at the site of Palmyra in um, eastern Syria. I hate to think of what it looks like today, uh, but that was, I was felt very lucky to travel. Um, and for more travel, I signed I, myself on for working as an archaeological illustrator on different sites all around the eastern Mediterranean, as Carol mentioned. These are two Roman lamps from uh, the site of Cancriae in Greece. It's the eastern port of the site of Corinth, you know, where St. Paul would have sailed in to preach to the Corinthians. So it was a... Um, there's a big Roman cemetery there, and so these are my drawings of those lamps. Um, probably from the first or second century AD. People usually ask, why do you illustrate these fragments from archaeology? Why not just take photos? And so, of course, everything is photographed, but this is an example of what you can do with a drawing that you can't with a photograph. So these are two fragments of probably a second or third century AD Roman glass bottle. It would have had a tall neck, maybe for perfume. And with the drawing, you can figure out the diameter of the, the interior of the vessel. And that means I could reconstruct that perhaps these would have joined. So the dotted lines there sh uh, show the edge, that they could have been one thing. And that is very difficult to capture on a photograph. And so that's useful for the whole sequence of um, the study of pottery across sites um, in the Mediterranean. 
And while I was in Cyprus, I met John Franklin, who's here. Thank you, John, for being here. Um, and who was working on his book, Canirus the Divine Liar, about Near Eastern influences of ancient Greek music. We then moved to Vermont, where John teaches at UVM. And I spent some time illustrating uh, this book, using uh, making illustrations based on photos. So no more time in the field. We had two little kids. It was snowing. It was not possible to, to work on a dig. But I was very happy to do these illustrations for the book. So this was a lyre player. And there's a lyre player in the center of this plaque from the site of Megiddo, ancient Armageddon. And I drew maps for this book based on existing maps that show all iconography of ancient music. These two, the Iron Age and the, the Bronze Age before, are just the time of 1177. Around this time, also, I had made, drawn a lot of single panel comics, but I wanted to learn how to make comics in sequence, like uh, tell a story with multiple panels. And so I drew, at John's suggestion, comics for the Homeric hymns. And these are some pages of me going to my self-imposed comic school using an ancient text to figure out how to pace out a story over, the, over panels. At the same time, I was or around this time also, I was invited by um, um, Andy Kolvos to participate in this Most Costly Journey project. Um, this was the Vermont Reads book I think last year. So I was, I was very pleased to be part of this and draw this story of Anna for this. Um, in maybe 2017, James Sturm, who is the co-founder of the Center for Cartoon Studies, which is in White River Junction, Vermont. So it's an hour and a half commute for me every week in the fall when I'm teaching. But working with James on this book about Charlotte Bronte also was a, a study in how to pace and tell stories visually. It also laid a lot of groundwork for using research, uh, visual research, and in, in page composition, especially something like this, where I had to rely on very few existing photos of uh, places where the Brontes um, lived in. This is a scene from Brussels, where they were in school for a while, Charlotte and Emily, anyway. At this, <laughs> while I was working on this book, I had, I, I had some funny ideas, which I sent to the New Yorker. I thought, I can solve all of 19th century literature just by giving everyone birth control. So Jane is saying, how do you, do you think because I'm poor, obscure, plain, and little that I don't also have an IUD? The villa in France sounds very nice, actually. <sighs> Um, and parenting books for the privileged throughout the ages. What to expect when you have low life expectancy medieval edition? Here, this belonged to my mother, my aunt, my sister, and her friend. If it isn't about courtly love, I don't want it. Understanding that if your five-year-old has lived this long, he will probably make it to at least 30. Happy birthday, kiddo. Here's a harvesting scythe. See you at sunset. So... Um, Laudanum and gin, how you and your Victorian child can stay fashionably sedated until this <laughs> repressive era is over. I hope this isn't still relevant, but... Uh... <laughs> okay, back to archaeology. Ah, and also, maybe around 2015 or 16, Rob Tempio, the editor at Princeton Press, who first invited Eric to write uh, 1177, asked me to illustrate his, uh, his book, Three Stones Make a Wall. So here's my, I did chapter headings and um, um, illustrations within the book. So here's Sophie Schliemann, the excavator of Troy's wife, dressed in the, the so-called gold of Troy and a Trojan horse and other fancy drawings like this one of Pompeii and Masada. So these I felt like were very serious and I was using photo references. 
while I was working on this, and I established a relationship with the press and Rob Tempio, he said, why don't you read 1177 BC and see if it wouldn't make a good uh, graphic um, history. And so I did. And January 1st, 2020, I wrote this very enthusiastic email to Rob and Eric um, saying, yes, I could do this. I envisioned bringing out individual stories of various characters through text, as well as filling it with images from ancient art, archaeology, and landscapes. And Rob said, yes, go for it. Make me a book proposal. And so I turned to page one, prologue, uh, and created a uh, eight-page book proposal uh, from that prologue. And you can see I used word for word um, Eric's text. Um, and, and these guys, you've seen them already um, in the prologue as it exists now. By May, Rob was delighted to make an offer for the graphic 1177, and we all agree the best timing would be spring 2022. Well, happy 2024. Uh, this, you know, uh, knowing these dates, the pandemic, my kids were home for most of, of that year. Um, it, was a, it was a difficult time. Um, not only that, but I put a lot more time and energy into this than anyone predicted, <laughs> including me. But um, finally, we got approval for this, um, the book proposal. And I, it was time to get to work. So what I did is take all of um, Eric's 1177, uh, printed it out into chapters, and started to mark it up and figure out what would go where on the page. So here's a picture of my thumbnails. That is, I got a ream of 11 by 17 paper, made a page template uh, for double page spreads, because I wanted to be able to have images that covered two pages. Um, and here's an, um, the other thing about this book is it's two, uh, Eric's original book is 250 pages, and my book had to be 250 pages. So that means cutting out an absolute majority of the text. I, could, I had to figure out how to tell this in images because there were some pages that I felt like needed more space that in order to um, amp the drama. For example, this two sentences really is, encapsulates what this book is, is about on both sides, building up and, and, and analyzing why this happened. So beyond Egypt, all of the other countries and powers of the second millennium BC in the Aegean and Near East, those that have been present during the golden years of what we now call the Late Bronze Age, withered and disappeared either immediately or within less than a century. In the end, as it, it was as if civilization had itself had been wiped away. So I paced this out in four panels. I'm thinking of uh, four panels like this as a four, uh, between three and five act structure. So a panel that establishes the good time in that region. That's a panel that, am that amplifies that. This time it's on fire. The, um, the climax of destruction and then the what's happened last. So thinking about telling a story through this kind of pacing. So what you see here is my thumbnail and then a, a larger drawing where I worked out details on larger paper. The next stage was to draw this all over again using nicer paper and um, inking in pencil. Then I scanned the pages to Photoshop, added a page spread template as a separate layer, exported that to an iPad Pro to, and the program Procreate to color on separate layers. And the layers. Um, and then I added panel borders and these inset panels. And then the word balloons. And then text in InDesign. And 
I had, I had this, the text is a font um, created of my lettering because I wanted this to have an informal voice in terms of, of text. Um, so I, it, and it had to be unique, it had to be mine, which was an investment. Um, edits could happen at the last minute, so we changed that last line. Um, this is um, a whole different page, but Procreate will export a, um, a recording of my work on a page. So this is me drawing the word balloons, and the color's coming soon. Um, um, this page is about the Ulubarun shipwreck, which is a wreck that sunk around 1300 BC off the coast of Turkey. And um, theories about why that wreck went down and what was on it and where they were going and what they were doing. So that was, so there's the final page as it is. And when one of the theories was the Mycenaeans were going on a shopping expedition, I had to put in get in losers were going to Canaan because it's the time of mean girls. <laughs> so here's another one of these um, watch me color. This one is from chapter three and it's, it's interesting because this is about Linear B tablets that were found there that have names of people that, that are from other places besides Greece, and um, including Aegypt, Aegyptos, now it's covered, so that's, there, look, I've like adding highlights. Um, that's what the final page looks like. And when there's someone named a, a, a Egyptian at Knossos who has 80 sheep, I ask myself, how did I get here? So that guy has a, has a, a life story that we'll never know. How did an Egyptian get to Greece? To So count the technologies that went into this page spread. Pencil on paper, nicer pencil on nicer paper. A light table, scanner. Photoshop, Procreate, InDesign, Adobe Acrobat, and uh, whatever program is running this on, <laughs> I should say. Um, so that makes it seem like it was really straightforward and easy, and I just, ju I just got to work and made this book. Um, I wish, because at, um, here, this is an example of the edits that I sent every chapter as I finished it to Eric Klein, and this is me checking off the changes he made. Most of these are line edits, which was before I figured out how to use the spelling, spell check in InDesign, um, and after that it was a lot easier. But I, um, so we, we talked every time I finished, but for the most part it was all me that was designing these pages. So by March 2021, I'd finished coloring the prologue in chapter one. I printed these pages out and shared them with Eric. You can see here that I, I circled in red every time there's a voiceover in this comic. Um, I mean, if you've read comics, they're, they're, they're often, I mean, sometimes there is this a text box that gives you where you are, what the, the circumstances are, but this has a lot. Eric said, what about a narrator or narrators? Eric himself or the two of us? Um, in the original 1177, Eric's voice is very clear. It's, it's, but the book is not about Eric. It's about, he's, you, he's telling the stories of ancient people, and he's the one connecting them. But it's not, it's, it's, it's Eric's book, but it's not about him. I was and reacting to some um, Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics, where he talks about, uh, he, he is a narrator all through, talking about how style and other um, elements of comics affect your reading of them, and more, a more recently published book by Yuval Harari, which is a comparable book to what I've done. He is the figure of Harari is very present as a narrator, as a professor who's walking you through the landscape and telling you what to see and, and um, speaking about it. I wanted to avoid these things because I didn't want this book to seem like a TED talk. 
and that everything you knew about slowly going s insane on a desert island was wrong. Um, because as you see in, in, for example, a Calvin and Hobbes comic, the real estate that each character takes up on the page makes that book about them. And again, I wanted the ancient people's stories to be in the forefront. And by the way, even Calvin and Hobbes are, um, uh, Calvin's saying, archeologists have the most mind numbing job on the planet. I don't know, Calvin, I don't know. Um, and so I, after that conversation with Eric about narrators, I was, I, I was thinking, who could do this job? And this is an early page before all edits, and I'm zooming in on this guy. It's, this is a drawing um, taken after something that appeared on the Egyptian temple of sea people's families either um, coming into Egypt. And if there's a family with driving in a cart, a kid is going to say, Dad, can I drive? And the dad's going to say, no, I need to concentrate. And the mom says, whatever you do, don't take us into battle. I think my son might have been learning to drive at this time, so um, it just happened. Um, that I've, I heavily revised this page, so um, this, is, this is a relief carving. It's, a, it's a, my imitation of. And here are my main characters who came into this book. Hell saying, I was too young. I don't remember exactly why we came. Maybe my parents were motivated by spoils, or we were fleeing drought, famine, or population pressures. So that's exactly from Eric's book, as he's phrased it. But I put it into the mouth of this character who, was, who, who doesn't know why because he was too young. And Shesha's whole job is to look into all the possibilities. So that's what this page looks like now. And then, um, a, a, that's from the beginning of the prologue. Here's the end of the prologue. Uh, I told you not to drive into battle. Um, how would I know Egyptian army would attack families? Here's, the, here's my source material, by the way, from the temple. And Hel and Shesha saying, for the past century, the sea peoples have so often been blamed we can't know for sure whether they caused the destructions and they were, um, or they were more likely victims than aggressors. So here's Pell from the introduction and Shesha from the introduction describing their roles. Um, and, you, and so, um, if you remember, I had already drawn the prologue and chapter one without these characters. And so what I, I did is, on separate pieces of paper, figure out where they would go and drew them over and over to fit into pages. So you can see the page numbers written by the characters as I was editing them into the book, which took about two months. And so here they are in this page again. You've seen this before, but now it's got El and Shesha. And I'm going to go through how this page came about. In, this is one of the stories that when I first read the book, I thought, OK, this will make a good graphic adaptation because it has hippos. The Hyksos king, Apophis, complains that he's being kept awake all night. So here's my thumbnail, with thumbnails, which is like really full of, of uh, text and probably tricky to read. But the main points are there, including this King Apophis saying, I can't sleep. By my penciled version, I have him saying, how am I, Apophis, King of the Hyksos, supposed to rule Egypt without a good night's sleep? So I wanted to raise the stakes here. It's not just he can't sleep, but he needs to rule Egypt. And here's the penciled version and the in, in Photoshop and a color layer, another color layer, what it finally looks like. Now we get to read it. So here he is again saying that. 
It's the fault of the Egyptian ruler Seknen Re. His hippos bellow all night long. Roar! <laughs> Seknen Re. If you can't make your hippos quiet down, I'll bash your head in with an axe. And he has an axe right there handy, just, just in case. Pophis is preposterous. My hippos are 200 miles away up the Nile from him. Oh, there's no way he can hear you, my beauties. He's just bothered that I'm ruling simultaneously. And now here's Eric, um, who is here on his role of narrator, but only for the things that the ancient people could not know. So Eric oversees everything post 19th century. When archaeologists recovered Seknen Ray's mummy, they found a gash in the skull made by a battle axe. I warned you, Seknen Ray. So here's Pell and Shesha commenting on that story, but you'll have to read the book to uh, find out why. Um, here's yet another example. This is an example of how. Um, my adaptation of the book includes a bit more information. So this is from much later in the book, uh, theorizing about the, the arrival of the Sea Peoples in, the, in Canaan. They, instead of, as most uh, people learned earlier in the, let's see, the 1950s onward probably, that it was the Sea Peoples who ended the Bronze Age. Now there are more theories that, that it was a peaceful picture of a mixed group of migrants in search of a new start in a new land. So that's my imagining of that. Who brought with them a new type of pig and several species of plants. So there's my note to follow up on footnote 52 Whatever article Eric was referring to, I didn't have access to, so I wrote him an email and said, what type of plants? And he sent back the article that uh, causes this character to say, you Canaanites have never tried coriander, cumin, bay, sycamore, opium, or bacon? These flavors will blow your minds. This calls for a feast. And the last example. Instead of accepting that the idea that private merchants and their enterprises undermined the Bronze Age economy, so the idea that the Sea Peoples uh, were trading separately from major palace economies in the late Bronze Age, this made me think of these guys initiating an era of free trade. We may be invading, but we've got deals, deals, deals. This irresistible hat, for example. And this theory that instead of accepting the idea that private merchants undermine the economy, I have put that into the voice of these two sisters who are overlooking the town square, watching this uh, trade going on, saying, those Pelesset are trying to destabilize the old established systems. Dagger anyone? And a direct quote from um, archaeologist James Muley. Um, who says, actually, well, I added their low down sea raiders, pirates, and freebooting mercenaries because you can't have sea raiders without low down. Um, <laughs> and no way, sister, your thinking has become so uptight. There are merchants exploiting new economic opportunities, new markets, and new sources of raw materials. So these sisters are arguing big questions up there. And out of chaos comes opportunity, at least for a lucky few. Here's a version of the Sea People story I like. And yet the collapse happened. And now um, there, I'm just going to show a few uh, kind of like my personal greatest hits of um, panels that I liked drawing. Um, the excavators have described a sudden appearance of new cultural patterns expressed in architecture, ceramics, diet, and crafts, particularly weaving. And so I imagine these migrants appearing at the sh on the shore of Canaan with all this interesting new stuff, and uh, a Canaanite saying, your dress is fire. I'll show you how to make one as soon as I set up my loom. 
our understanding of the situation in Canaan is evolving. And let's skip right to this talk. Here's the teen Canaanite saying, oh, and ball, those hats. I've forgotten the Egyptians already. They just left. You can use my loom. Why not stay with us? Welcome to Canaan. We brought wine to share. Party at our place tonight. B-Y-O-L-M-3-C-1-B. Okay, that's a very obscure joke because it's referring to the categorization system of um, Minoan pottery. Uh, okay, moving right on. <laughs> like the fall of the Roman Empire, the L late Bronze Age collapse and transition to the Iron Age was an ongoing event. So um, Eric argues that in some places it was immediate, in some places it took over it took a, uh, over a hundred years. So here's Pell asking the women hanging up the laundry, "How's collapse going for you?" So boring. It just keeps going on and on and on. And yes, but 1177 was most exciting for Egypt, maybe. Can't argue with land and sea battles. But other places had already collapsed. Like, we haven't had any letters from Hattusha in ages. I don't know who she's talking to in Anatolia, but it's not happening. This also allowed me to play with the uh, composition and the um, elements of design that went into this. So this page is about the ripple effects of these events. Drought causes harvests to, to fail, famine, migration, Hittites defeated, trade routes to Greece cut, no more exports of silver, lack of goods for small independent merchants out of business, pirates disrupt trade, Cyprus blockaded, no more copper, scarcity of bronze, famine and war in Syria, no more tin from Afghanistan, Ugar Ugarit destroyed, trade hub gone, Mutual defense pacts nullified, scarcity of food, rebellion. Egypt is defending itself from invaders, can't send grain, gold, or even dirt. That's a callback to an earlier joke. People leave cities in search of refuge and farmland. Um, this sounds a bit chillingly like what's happening now. And um, Eric Klein's next book, which is called After 1177, is all about which of these regions in the Eastern Mediterranean um, survived through the Iron Age through varying degrees of resiliency. So um, as, I, as I described, Pell and Shesha, my characters, didn't join the book until chapter two. Here's the start of chapter three, and by this time they were well in it. They were like not just narrating stuff, they were there. So, here they are uh, watching the uh, Pell saying, Shesha, we've got to help that ship. Too late. It's going down. Where was it going? Where was it coming from? We don't know. But what we do know is that when this ship went down sometime around 1300 BC, someone lost a fortune. So this is about the shipwreck at Ulubarun that I mentioned earlier. It's a good thing they didn't save it, sadly, because it was loaded with uh, all kinds of things that made a marker in time that archaeologists have been able to trace to all over the Mediterranean. There's the ship with all its copper ingots and other goodies. Um, this page shows all the things that were found on that wreck, so anchors, daggers, ivory, new pottery from all over, ingots of glass, gold jewelry, Parabinth resin, yum, 10 tons of copper, so uh, an enormous fortune. Here they are again in their little boat in, at the beginning of um, chapter 4. When, we're, uh, um, when Eric and the characters of Eric and me are standing in front of the wrecked city of Ugarit in Syria that I got to visit, um, way back when I was living there. And the next page is what it l would have looked like, at least an artist's impression of what it would have looked like in the late Bronze Age. And with this, 
My, another uh, thing that I had fun with is playing with the fact that Shesha could read all the ancient languages and Pell was illiterate. So here he's saying, I'm guessing Ugaritic is no problem for you. And um, there is a tablet from Ugarit that has their alphabet on it, and, Sh and Shesha suggests that he could learn. Is there time? Um, somehow he knows that there's, this city is about to be burned. But he's trying. Anytime that there was a job for a scribe, I had Shesha take up that job. So here's this, this uh, uh, character from Ugarit asking her to take a letter to the king of Cyprus. She does. Here's what that whole page looks like. They got, I, I got to uh, draw the discovery of King Tut's tomb in, four, in uh, a page and another job for a scribe. Um, introducing the Zananza affair. This is probably the widow of King Tut asking, her, asking Shesha to write a letter that's going to Anatolia and no spelling mistakes. Nearing the end of the book, they're, they're studying the, the harem conspiracy that killed Ramses III and they get to be there for when um, the Egyptian when Amun washed up on the shore of Cyprus that a, a classic of Egyptian literature that every scribe knows and Pels thinks it's almost worth learning to read. And that's the end. Thank you so much. I'm very glad to take any questions. Rob, you have to wait for a microphone, right? You referenced in the wreck some kind of rosin, terebinth of rosin or something. Oh, yeah, what terebinth is that? resin. What was the use of that? Yeah. Damn, Rob, that's a tricky one. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, they could have been added to wine. It, it could have been like, um, I, I, I would think it could be like making things watertight. Anyone know any, uh, any, uh, any uh, and otherwise? What would terebinth resin have been used for? Let's look it up. <laughs> what uh, two two things? Um, uh, what 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 would be an appropriate age for uh, you know a young boy or a girl? This book? Yeah. Uh, so uh, an appropriate age? I would think anywhere from like fourth or grade up. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, why not give it to just any, any age kid and see what happens? Right, right. <laughs> Let them chew on it. And then, <laughs> and then the second thing is I, I've heard of the, the breakdown of 1177, but I, you know, you touched on it, but could you give us a little bit more? The clue? You mean yeah. um, you don't want to read the book? Well, we do. <laughs> Uh, Eric, Eric puts forward many theories, and I think he really comes to a climate that's changed. The whole second half of this, well, maybe the second third of the book, is going through the various theories. Um, um, higher, drier climate in Greece coming north. I mean, I mean coming like a, a climate change that seems to be coming from the north, traveling south, so that pushing people south, uh, like lower rainfall, meaning crops could, would be failing, so that people were leaving, seeking other places to grow food, which would lead to famine, which could lead to disease, which could lead to, you know, if there's migration, there's conflict between people who are moving. And so I think he, his, his idea that it's a perfect storm of, these, of things that come together that cause this. 
but climate change is in the forefront. And when, um, when Eric Klein first published 1177 in tw uh, um, 2014, uh, by 2021, he, the book has been reissued with much more information because between that time, there was a lot more research done about um, things like analyzing seafloor core uh, and in, in the Nile Delta that showed that there was much lower inundation in the Nile, as well as like um, um, somehow figuring out that caves in Greece and Israel had stalactites or stalagmites, I never know which one is which, that had stopped dripping, that, that the moisture was so low that they just stopped growing. For a, a, a period of about 150 years from around the 12th century to maybe the 9th century uh, BC. So those, those the research that um, confirms that theory that people were really struggling because of the climate. So uh, on the internet, um, they spent a lot of time talking about how they found it on that boat and everything. Right. But the evidence is that the use of the t there, that there was use of the terebinth resin in the perfumed oil industry, and as incense in the late Bronze Age. Greece. Good. Thank you for that. Here's a Zoom question. It seems like you work closely with the author. How was that experience? I I um, let's see. I I mostly did this. Um, just working on my own, and when I finished every chapter, I sent it to Eric, and he gave suggestions. There were, I think, two times when he suggested, "Why don't you move these pages here, and you know, move text or, or you know, move pages someplace else?" But for the most part, that was quite straightforward, and it was really, uh, it was a very good working relationship. Anytime I asked him a question, like. Uh, I forgot to ask him, what is terebinth for? <laughs> Maybe I did and I forgot. But, you know, like, what, what are these other plants that the Philistines or, or sea peoples could have brought? He wrote back right away. Or I said, could you give me a map of all the earthquakes that took place at a certain time? And he, you know, sent it immediately. Or, uh, yeah, so he was very quick to respond and supply images and um, was not, so it was a pretty smooth editorial process that way, um, and, which was great. I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the original source material you might have used to base your artwork on. Yeah, I used a lot of image searches, but I also have a very good library of books that are full of images. Um, I've also spent a lot of time in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, and so the, the experience and memory of that really helped. But for example, those drawings of Ugarit are from photos that I found on the internet, or the or the reconstruction one was. There's an an artist who does amazing reconstructions of many ancient cities. And I re I com I did not I re completely redrew it and added things that are not in. So I and yeah the internet. <laughs> yeah, thanks for a most engaging presentation. I was interested in your Fulbright experience in Cyprus. Yes. Living there, um, I wondered if you went on both sides of the island and how that experience of being with people in Cyprus impacted your future um, creations. I, I think Thanks. that it changed it tremendously. That, that was, one of, that was a, one of the best times of life, really. And when I was there, it was, it was um, 1999 to 2001 was the Fulbright, and then I stayed on afterwards and worked for the Department of Antiquities and then other uh, other excavation projects, but it was all through connections that I made through through being there. I lived at the 
American Archaeological Research Institute, Cyprus American, so Kari. Uh, I met John there, so that was that's very successful. Um, but uh, when I though, during those years, it was it it was very frowned upon for people working on the Greek side of Cyprus to visit the north, and so I went to the north side before I really knew, <laughs> realized that that was the case. Um, for, for anyone who doesn't know, Cyprus is a divided island. Um, it's, it's got a wall of barbed wire uh, dividing it, and there were checkpoints in Nicosia that at the time when, when I was there, Cypriots themselves could not cross. So the thought was, if you're going to the north, you're supporting the, the illegal regime there. And, um, and you're, you're using your privilege as a foreigner to do something that a local Cypriot can't do. And so I didn't go to the north because of that. But I've been back twice, and we did go to the north those two times because it had opened to Cypriots at that time, and you could just walk across the border. But I've, I've drawn... I've drawn about that. I made a short comic about it for a publication. And um, I have an idea for another book that would be about that time and about the experience of working in archaeology there and the politics of that. And I hope to um, talk to Cypriot friends there about their experiences, especially of the Turkish invasion that happened in 1974. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a lot. That's a lot to take on. So, what are your next projects? Uh huh. Right, right now, I'm working on a book for kids, older kids. That's a graphic novel that I'm writing myself. That's about a family of artists at the time of the eruption of Santorini. Um, you know, that island, the, that picturesque island in Greece that was a volcano that erupted. It was the most devastating volcanic eruption and left the town of Akrotiri as a kind of Bronze Age Pompeii. So there's very well-preserved uh, wall paintings. And so this book of mine is like my autobiography transposed into the ancient world plus a lot of fan art of uh, ancient painting. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm working out on. I hope to finish it this year, and I hope it'll be published in 2026. This was fascinating, and you are so talented. What, a, tr what a treat. Thank you so much. Can I, I wanted to add that this book, so this book just came out. And uh, Phoenix Books has copies um, that are signed, because I signed them last night. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but if you can't get there, there's flyers here from Princeton Press that have a code on them for 30% off that works until October. And so I recommend it for like any age group. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.